All right. Well, thank you, Carol. And uh, welcome to HBF again. And we are glad that you're here. Uh, Carol has a tremendous testimony. If you don't know her testimony, uh, she's a great ambassador for the cause of, of the uh, Crisis Pregnancy Center as, as uh, she herself has uh, lived and walked through all of those steps and, uh, and as now God has saved her soul and uh, using her to change the lives of others through the gospel. So uh, we're excited about what God's doing through her and Linda and others that volunteer and help. If you have your Bibles, please be turning the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 30. And we're going we're gonna to get after it for the time that we have remaining. If you're joining us on Facebook, we are glad that you're here watching us this morning. And we invite you to come back and uh, see us anytime uh, you can, as soon as you have opportunity. And so uh, we're going to be in the book of Deuteronomy. So we have been going through discovering our DNA sermon series, talking about uh, the need to, uh, you know, um, you know, see the church as we've been looking at the church grow and go. But I wanted to just take a, in the time that we have, just kind of continue to talk about this subject of, of choosing life. Because here in a few weeks, we're going to be choosing deacons. And so choosing life takes many forms. And in the time I have remaining, I hope to, to share that with you. So since we don't have a lot of time, I hope you are on uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 30. If you don't have a Bible, uh, you can grab one from the seat rack in front of you. We'll be on page 184. 184 in the Bibles that are in the seat rack in front of you. And we're going to look at this text. This text, by way of context, is the Lord Jesus Christ giving commandment, or God giving commandment, I should say, to the nation of Israel as they have uh, waited long enough to enter the promised land. We're getting toward the end of Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law. They're getting ready to move forward in their life as a nation. They're getting ready to seize hold the promises that God had given them, even though they had been disobedient, even though they had not done everything that God called them to do. God was still going to bless them and use them to go forward and establish the nation of Israel. And so he, he gives them some straight talk in chapter 30, and I wish we had time to get into all of it, but in the, we don't. So I want to just pick it up in verse 15, Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 15. The Bible says in verse 15, See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but thou shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou possessest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice and that thou mayest cleave unto him. For he is thy life and the length of thy days that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning as we look at this text, as we look at the word of God and we remember the great promises that you had for Israel and the great promises that still remain for the nation of Israel. Lord, we are thoughtful and mindful of the great promises that we have in Christ. Lord, we pray this morning as we look at this word, as we consider what it is to choose life, the incredible opportunity we have to hear and receive and then act upon the word of God. Lord, we pray, God, this morning that we would take that responsibility seriously and, Lord, that we would see the responsibility before us because it is loaded with blessing. Lord, we are so thankful for your desire to bless your children. We're so thankful for what you want to entrust unto us. You want to entrust life to us. You have given us your word. You have given us your truth. And you are the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray this morning as we look into the word of God that you would meet with us here. Heavenly Father, I pray you would stir our hearts and that we would leave here different than when we came in. Lord, that we would be encouraged in the word of God. Lord, that we would be filled with your spirit. Lord, that we would go out of here today ready to take the gospel where it needs to go on time so people can hear the gospel, so that they can be saved, that they can have life in Christ. Oh God, I pray that you would shake off and purge off the dross in our hearts, Lord. Lord, I pray, God, you'd quicken us in a mighty way to receive the word of God, to believe the word of God, to obey the word of God. Oh God, may we be filled today 
with the Spirit of God and go forth out of here changed. We thank you and we praise you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning I want to speak to you obviously about choosing life. Choosing life. And I want to just take you on a tour. You're in Deuteronomy. So let's just take a couple verses. Let's see what God thinks about this issue of life in regard to what we've just heard in the context of, of what Carol presented. But I want to, I'll transition to, believe it or not, this will get to the deacon selection toward the end. So just hang with me and, uh, and hang on. But Deuteronomy 18 and verse 10. This is not on the overhead because I did not give these uh, to the, the booth in time. So uh, this is an audible that God gave me right before the service. I want you to see these verses. So you have to go old school is what I'm saying. You're going to have to open up your Bible and look at the text. Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, just a few pages back, verse 10. Notice what the Lord says here. He says, There shall not be found among you anyone that, that, that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that use a divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. The people that were in the promised land were people that were actually doing those things. They were sacrificing their children. They were involved in spiritual uh, witchcraft and, and all kinds of spiritism. There's nothing new under the sun. Go to 2 Kings chapter 16 in your Bible. 2 Kings chapter 16. I want you to see verse 3. 2 Kings 16. Fast forward the tape now. Israel's in the promised land. We've already read 1 Corinthians, right? We understand, or I mean, sorry, 1 Corinthians. Where'd that come from? We've already read Deuteronomy. We understand where, where God's going with the nation of Israel. We know that he wants them to choose life. So now we are in a time of Israel's uh, departure. They're going into captivity. Notice what the Lord says to them. 2 Kings, the second book of Kings, chapter 16, 2 Kings 16 and verse 3. 2 Kings 16 and verse Three, I'll just read it from verse 1, give you time to get there. 2 Kings 16 and verse 3. In the 17th year of Pekah, son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. 20 years old was Ahaz when he, he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord God like David his father. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. You following me here? The king of Judah was following the pattern of the kings of the ten tribes of Israel. He was doing what they were doing. Yea, and he made his sons to pass through the fire according to the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. What's that mean? Verse 4. He sacrificed and burnt incense in high places on, every, on the hills and under every green tree. And part of his sacrifices was to offer his children to these dumb idols. 2 Kings chapter 17, next chapter, verse 17. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. They sacrificed their children to idols to get the benefits, the bennies of the pagan gods that they thought would hear their prayer. 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 6. Keep on going. We're not done yet. 2 Kings chapter 21, 2 Kings 21 and verse 6. And he made his son to pass through the fire and observe times and enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards and he wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a graven image of, gro of the grove that he had made in the house which the Lord said to David and Solomon his son in this house in Jerusalem which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel will I put my name forever. It was an abomination. An abomination. Here the kings of the nation of Israel were sacrificing their own sons. They were being in a, they were, they, the leaders were involved in the activity that God expressly forbid and instead of choosing life, they were choosing death. Now, what does God think about that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Turn to Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 32. If you go to Isaiah, just keep going, and you'll hit Jeremiah. If you get to Ezekiel, back up, and you'll hit Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32, verse 35. And they built a high place of Baal, 
which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch, which I commanded them not, neither came into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. God is saying to Jeremiah the prophet, this is so abominable, it never even came into my mind that my people would come to this place. It never entered my thoughts that when I gave them the choice of life that they would choose death. That was never in my heart to begin with. And yet, this is what it's come to, and it's an abomination. So what does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Turn to Ezekiel. Keep going past Jeremiah, and you'll get to Ezekiel chapter 23. Ezekiel chapter 23 and verse 37. Ezekiel chapter 23 and verse 37. Well, I'll, speak, I'll back up just one more verse to verse 36. It says, The Lord said, Moreover unto me, Son of man, wilt thou judge Aholah and Aholabah? Yea, declare unto them their abominations, that they have committed adultery, and blood is in their hands, and their idols have they committed adultery, and have caused their sons whom thou bear unto me to pass through the fire to devour them. Moreover, this have they done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day and have profaned my Sabbaths. For when they had slain their children to their idols, then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus have they done in the midst of mine house. And furthermore, that ye have sent for men to come from far unto whom a messenger was sent. And lo, they came for whom thou didst wash thyself, paintest thy eyes, and decked thyself with ornaments, and, and sattest upon a stately bed and a table prepared before it, whereupon thou hast set mine incense and mine oil." And a voice of multitude being at ease with her and with the men of the common sort were brought uh, Sabaeans from the wilderness which put bracelets upon their hands and beautiful crowns upon their heads. Then said I unto her that was old in, adult, in adulteries, will thou now commit whoredoms with her and she with them? Yet they went unto her as they go in unto a woman that playeth the harlot, so they went they into Ahola and Abahola and lewd women. And so we see here that the Lord was not happy with this spiritual adultery. It was resulting in literal death of children. And he promises them that he is not going to hear their prayer. He won't hear their prayer because of this. They're in a dire strait. They're in a dire situation. How did it get there? Well, I... We know the answer because we read it at the beginning. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, where we started off, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, they had an option. They had an option to choose life. Now, I know many hearing this today are going to make a jump and assume, well, you're talking about abortion. Well, of course I'm talking about abortion, but that's just a symptom. That's not the problem. The problem is the, the reality that the church is salt and light. We are the pillar and ground of the church, uh, truth, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. We are the very place where the truth is magnified, where, where these things are, like, like God says, I, these things don't even come to our heart. Yet, obviously, we have a compassion for, for people who find themselves offering their children to idols, even if that idol is a greenback or their boyfriend or some deadbeat that won't take care of his responsibilities. Whatever that may be, right? So we get that. We don't expect lost people to act saved. But what we desperately need to do is make sure that saved people act like saved people. Right? That we do our part. That we choose life. Because I tell you what, there is not a people on the planet that are more important to what goes on in a country like ours than us. And the, and the many other people like us who believe the word of God, who teach the word of God. And most importantly, above and beyond abortion and all of those things, take the gospel where it needs to go on time so people's souls are not aborted and cast into hellfire. You see, we really got to care about people to get any traction. Because if we don't care, guess what? They will be cast into outer darkness forever. And you think abortion of, of, of a baby is bad. It's bad. God's not happy with it. I've just declared that from the word of God. He wasn't happy in the Old Testament. He's not happy with a nation that says, in God we trust, condoning it today. And he's not going to be happy in the future with that kind of behavior. You can mark it down. 
But equally so, he's not happy with the fact that people are dying and going to hell by the bucket loads because they haven't heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in a clear and concise way from the people of God. And I'm not saying you guys don't do that. You're the amen choir. You're here on a Sunday when it's snowing and all that, right? But we can't break our arm patting ourselves on the back because we got out in the snow. Because as, as sure as the coldest snow is out here and the freezing temperatures remind us of, of how, how cold and icy it can be, man, that's a picture of people's hearts. And someday those icy hearts are going to be cast into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, man, and their souls are forever going to perish if they don't hear the gospel. So let me tell you in the time I have remaining why we need to choose life. In Deuteronomy 30 and verse 15, we need to choose life because we can. We need to choose life because we can. I mean, that's what the text says, right? In verse 15, he says, uh, he says, see, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. God gave them a choice. God set before Israel life and good, death and evil. They had 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, right? To think about that. It's, it's after 40 years of, re, after rebelling in the land of, uh, of, uh, of uh, in Numbers chapter 13 and not going forward in faith to conquer and, and receive the promises in the promised land, God says, that's okay, you're in timeout. So think about this. And 40 years later rolls around, they're finally ready to go back in. He says, hey, listen, I know there's giants in front of you and I know it looks like to you, just like it did to the first crop of people, that were protecting their babies. We can't go into the promised land because we've got to protect our children. We can't engage the culture because it'll defile our kiddos. And God says, listen, you're going to die in the wilderness and your kids are going to have to face the giants. So now their kids are all grown up and he says, guys, don't make the same mistake. I'm choosing life and I'm choosing you, but you're going to have to go by faith and you're going to have to go forward and you're going to have to face the giants. But don't kid yourself. If you stick with me, there's life. And if you deny me, there is death. God loves us and he wants us to have life. In Deuteronomy, look at what it says uh, real quickly. In Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 6, to kind of kick off this second giving of the laws as, as Moses is laying this out, God brings a word to, to Moses and he says, The Lord our God spake unto us in Horeb, saying, Ye have dwelt long enough in this mount. You, you've been here long enough. It's time for you guys to move on. If you go over to chapter, uh, chapter uh, 2 and verse 3. He says something very similar to that. And he says, ye have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn northward, right? Go northward. You've been here long enough. You've dwelt long enough in this mountain. You've compassed this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. God didn't want failure. He didn't want disobedience to, divine his, to, divine, to define, not divine, to define his children any more than you or I do. Is there a person in here today that says, hey, I want my kid to be a failure. Man, I hope my kid bombs out in life. I hope they really run my name through the mud. No, no parent wants that. That's not what any parent wants for their child. That's not what God wanted for his people. He didn't want them to forever be defined by Numbers 13, that group of people, that hard-hearted, rebellious group of people who would not go forward by faith. He's like, no, no, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to give you an opportunity. To just simply choose, choose life. Go forward in faith and do what I've called you to do. Be obedient in faith because I need you to, to accomplish the mission. God wants to bless his people. We sing a lot of these affirming songs today, and we should, because God does affirm us. But we need to affirm him and say, amen, Lord, yes. We will obey you because we love you back. We know God loves us. The question is not God's love for us, right? The question on the table, as we look at the nation of Israel's history, as we look at our own history, as I look at my own history with my God in heaven, is do I love him? Because the Bible's very clear that if we love him, we will what? Keep his commandments. We'll keep his commandments. You say, well, we're not under the law. That's right, we're not. We don't keep the commandments because we have to. We keep the commandments because we want to we love him and you're not under the law I want to be clear about that in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34 the Lord says after the number of days in which he searched the land after even after 40 days each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities even 40 years and ye shall know my breach of promise he does tell and remind Israel that hey guys you did uh, stumble 
and you did pay some consequences. There is consequences to disobedience, even in the church age. Israel's unwillingness left them in the wilderness for 40 years. I pray this morning that we do not get stuck in the wilderness. We should choose life because we can, but also we should choose life because we should. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 16, the text goes on to say there, in that I commanded thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And that, thou, uh, and that the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess it. He's not even talking about all the scary things in the land. All he's talking about is the promises ahead. Choosing life is a matter of God's mission. It really is. It's a matter of God's mission. Love the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and statutes. Sounds a lot like Deuteronomy 6, 5, which says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Sounds a lot like Exodus 20 and verse 2. It says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, as he gives them the law in the Old Testament. Out of thy house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And it's awful reminiscent of Mark chapter 12 and verse 30. It says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God and all the, with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, hearkening back to Deuteronomy 6, or Exodus chapter 20 and verses 2 and 3. You see, as God tells the children, right, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Then he follows that up and says, And by the way, kids... That's the first commandment with promise. There's a promise of blessing. God's not wanting to beat you into submission. He's wanting to love you into submission, man. He's wanting to show you that when you take hold of my word, you're choosing life. When you obey what I have to say, you're choosing life. There's prosperity. There is power. There is there's grace. I don't have it in my notes. I had to take it out of my notes. I had a whole other section I was wanting to show you. It's so awesome. So now I'm going to shove it in real quick. When you see what happened in the garden with Adam and Eve and how they fell and how they ruined their seed and all of that awesome, I mean, there's a lot of stuff there. That's why I had to take it out. I don't have time for it. But then you go fast forward the tape, right? After, after Adam falls, after Cain slays Abel, after they choose death, what happens with Noah, man? He finds grace. And what happens to his kids, man? They get life through the judgment, man. They live through the judgment and they get life. Oh, God has a blessing for your kids, but you're going to need grace. You're going to need grace. I know I need grace. You need grace? Amen. Choosing life is a matter of the heart, even in the Old Testament. It's a matter of the heart, right? It's not just an intellectual exercise. It is a deal where God requires your heart, and he's tired. He gets tired of half-hearted efforts. He gets tired of people acting like they have a religion in Israel, having a temple, having all the, the, the rituals going on when he established that place to be focused on him and him alone. He didn't want to drag other pagan gods in there. He didn't want these kings offering their kids to, to, to other pagan gods and sacrificing them on altars. He didn't want the people of Israel going up on every high hill and having 50,000 other gods and goddesses or infertility goddesses and doing all of this perversion, all the same stuff that we are starting to see in our culture because people have lost a heart. It's not that they lost the word. It's not that they've lost the commandment. What happens when you take a baby and you, and, you, and you terminate its life? You can argue, is it, is it got a soul in its first breath or whatever? Who cares? God is the one that created that. Something has to go wrong. And I've been on both sides. I remember when I was lost, I used to think that was a great option. I, used, I mean, I might ask you to show your hands, but I'm going to publicly stand before you all. There was a time in my life when I was on the other side of this fence I mean in every way. I say those things. I think sometimes people think I'm just preaching. <laughs> I'm serious. I know what it's like to have my mind changed. You know how your mind gets changed on these subjects? It's not by persuasive arguments. It's not by just heartbeats alone. It's when God's truth comes through to you, when God gets a hold of your heart and you realize there's a God in heaven and he is the creator of life. And if it isn't about that, man, and then you know what? You know why we want to deny that? We want to deny that because if that's true, then we know that we're all about death. We know it's true.
Choosing life's a matter of the heart. Paul had Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 through 14 in mind when he wrote Romans 10. It says in Deuteronomy 30 and verse 14, but the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thine heart that thou mayest think about it. That thou mayest put it off. No, the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. Okay, Romans chapter 10, fast forward to the tape. My heart's desire and prayer for Israel is they might be saved. And he comes on down to verse eight and he says, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith. He's gonna define that for us in verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He says that is, in the text that I'm reading to you, that is the word, right, that we pay, which we preach. The word of faith. This is the word that you need to put your faith in. The word that we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Why are you going to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, my beloved? Because you understand that he alone is the authority to raise anyone from the dead. That he alone is the author of life. Oh my goodness, my, why wouldn't we put our faith in him? Because he is alive from the dead and is him that we must be saved through. So if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, guess what? Thou shalt be saved. Would you obey that command today? For with the heart man is, believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, not Brian Hedges, not, a do, not some denomination, not, no. Listen to me, beloved. The scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Choose life because it's good. It's good. Deuteronomy chapter 30, is, I'm going to get to the end here. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, that thou mayest obey his voice. Not because you have to, because you want to. And that thou mayest cleave unto him. You know, you know who you cleave to? I don't cleave to very many people. I cleave to my wife. I cleave to my kids. I might come up against some of you every once in a while and cleave unto you in a hug. I'll give my mama, I'll cleave unto my mom. I'll give her a good strong hug. I'll cleave unto her. But you cleave unto people you care about. Oh man, beloved, does it break God's heart that we don't cleave unto him? God wanted Israel to live more than they did. He wanted them to be right more than they did. He wanted life for them more than they did. There's something wrong when we choose death. And don't kid yourself, we've all done it in different ways, in different forms. By the way, the church of all people, we should be super gracious if we are dealing with people that are afflicted with, with the cho choosing death in a lot of different ways. I do want to balance what I'm saying. My zeal here is not about going after people who are in the bondages of sin. My zeal here is to recognize the love of Christ so that we can free people from the bondage of sin. Because how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? God forbid, man, that's not who we are. God wanted Israel to live more than they did. History would go on to show that heaven and earth were a witness against Israel because they did Choose death instead of life. Choosing death is a choice we make. Man, I, I, think, I am so thankful for all the mothers out there. There's been some moms in some tough situations, two of which I'm the, I'm the recipient. It's a hard thing to choose life sometimes because everything gets stacked against you. It's easier just to take care of business. It's the way the devil would like to do it. But God says, no, I want life. And I want it more abundantly. Proverbs chapter 8 says this, hear instruction, and be wise, refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors, for whosoever findeth me, <laughs> that's funny, whosoever findeth me findeth life, but I don't have it in my notes. <laughs> If you find him, you're going you're gonna to find life. Proverbs, I'm going to turn to there because I have more to say about that. How did that happen? Wow. Proverbs chapter 
Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 33. Hear instruction and be wise and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my posts. For whosoever, find, whosoever findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. And they that hate me, there they go, they that hate me, they love death. Beloved, there's some people that just hate God. And they love death. We live in a culture today that's based on, it's a culture of death. And it's a culture of death because people aren't choosing life. And I'm not talking about babies. I'm talking about Christ. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. The scientist says we don't want him involved in our creation. Well, guess what, pal? It's not your creation to start with. The politicians, they don't want him in the government because it threatens their authority, threatens their green agenda. The school board doesn't want him in the curriculum. They're fighting over here in Kansas about that. There they have been years past. The entertainment industry doesn't want him in their movies. The sinner doesn't want him in their heart. And the backslider doesn't want him in their conscience. But nevertheless, he's here. He's here and he is there. Heaven and earth are witness of God's glory. And you can't deny it. That's what Romans chapter 1 is all about. You can't get around him. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, I've talked to you about choosing life and I'm about done and I gotta get done quick. But I need you to choose deacons too. And you say, well, Brian, that's quite a pivot and that's not exactly congruent. Actually, it is. Every two years we nominate deacons and as you as members... It's your responsibility to nominate men who meet the character qualities of a deacon. And then we publish our top seven, if there are seven, and then we will publish their names. And indeed, if there's no exception and they are committed to serving in the office, then we appoint them. And uh, the church at Jerusalem was a very large church, uh, of course, much larger than ours, before they even selected anything that looked like deacons, even though they're not called deacons there. But it, came, it became necessary... This is why it became necessary. It's very clear in Acts chapter 6 and verse 4 that the apostles said that, you know what, we're going we're gonna to give ourselves to the word of God in prayer. And beloved, that was a choice the apostles made to focus on the word of God. This is going to sound terrible. They, they decided to focus on the word of God instead of widows. Well, why did they do that? Well, because we know in verse 1 why they did that, because it says very clearly in Acts 6, 1, you guys are familiar, most of you, with the text, and in those days when the disciples were multiplied. There are already people there ready to do it. There were disciples, people following Christ that could step in and take that job up and help with that. That doesn't mean, obviously, the apostles were not forward-minded about helping widows. As a matter of fact, uh, even the apostle Paul was very careful to make sure we all, including the pastors, bear the responsibility of helping and doing service to widows. But the point was simply this, they could not neglect the word of God in prayer, even for the widows. The disciples, obviously, were followers of Jesus. They weren't just Sunday attenders, right, people in the crowd. These were people who were serious about following Christ. And those were the ones that were brought in. God was taking the church somewhere. Now, this is where it all comes together. Because God had given the disciples a mission, and you guys, many of you know the mission very well. We like to use Matthew 28. There's, I'll give you several other references, but in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, you know, all power was given unto Christ. He transferred that power. They were to go to make disciples of all nations, right? Teaching them, it means literally make disciples. 
of all ethnic groups, all people groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've said unto you, right? And he, so they had a responsibility of communicating uh, not just the gospel, but also the full counsel of God's word, especially in the first century as it's being revealed. Now we have it revealed uh, in the word of God. So it's the same responsibility God has given pastors and teachers, deacons, and, and, uh, and, and the offices, actually the officers uh, in, uh, in the book of Ephesians 4.12 to help steward the res- same responsibilities in the church today. All right, so uh, moving on for time's sake. God is, is taking the church somewhere. And the church's job is to continue to make disciples. That's what the church does, is make disciples. And when disciples aren't making disciples, as I've been telling everybody lately, then disciples are going fishing. So one of the things Satan wanted to do was stop the church early. You know what he did? He's the same old methods that he employed in the Garden of Eden. He wanted to stop what was newly born, what was newly created. And he wanted, to, he wanted to stop it dead in its tracks. You see, Satan, he likes to strike early. He likes to stop things when it's starting. Are you praying for the church plants that we've sent out? He wants to start, he wants to stop them. He wants to stop them early. The devil's gonna attack them. Fortunately, though, for the church, <clears throat> Jesus is not the first Adam, but the last Adam. And he thwarts those attacks. In 1 Corinthians 15, 54, the Bible says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was a living soul, and the last man, Adam, was a quickening spirit. Where Adam failed, Christ succeeded, and where Eve fails, the church prevails. And so God has protected his church, and he has brought the church even to this day in this local assembly. We are holding firm and fast to the, to the word of God that we've been given, just as we're talking about the, the first church in the book of Acts and the church of Antioch going forth as we've been looking at on Sunday morning. And so in Acts chapter 6, just quickly with me, look there and we'll be, and I'm going to finish this up because uh, I am out of time. But Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says very clearly, I've already read that verse, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the, the multitude of the disciples unto them. And said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So notice they're selected by the congregation, but they're appointed by the the leaders. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And notice it says in verse 5, this saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and uh, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles when they had prayed, and they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples, here it comes, multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and the great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of the power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. We need to choose deacons because we can. Uh, there were disciples at Jerusalem who could take care of those widows, and so they were selected, and so they did. Here at HBF, we've had a rich history of deacons. Our first one was Joe Sparks. When we were a young church, we didn't need a lot of deacons. We had one deacon. His name was Joe. He was a, quite an example to follow. We had another deacon that we didn't even ever install. His name was Walt Cundiff. He'd never take the office, but you know what he did? He set an example of what a deacon was. You know, you don't even have to have an office to deacon. Would to God all the men of the body deke. That's who, the, that's who they selected, were the men that were already doing it. It's always funny to me, every year, top of our list, Walt Cundiff. You know what, every year I would, I would think, you know what, that church knows what they're looking for. Joe Sparks, Walt Cundiff, Bob Bolkin. Yep, those are deacons. We got living epistles among us. And I didn't mean to leave anybody out. I mean, the lead, Richard and Lance are great examples as well. We've had great deacons in this church. So we need to select those men and we need to find the ones that are qualified. First Timothy chapter three, you guys know the text, verses one through 14. The deacons are supposed to do what the pastors do. Likewise, right? And then it gives a list for the deacons and their wives. Those character qualities need to be there. If you don't know what they are, make sure you read that because it's important that they have the integrity, that they have the heart, that they're not looking for an office, they're not looking for a position, but they're looking for Christ and they're looking to serve Christ and his church. So we should choose deacons because we can. We should choose deacons because, well, we should as well. 
in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14, the Bible says um, these things right into you. After he talks about the deacons, their qualifications in verse 8, the deacons should be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, right? If you're going to stop murmuring, you can't very well be a participant of it. You can't give ear to it. holding the mystery of the faith in pure conscience. Let these also first be proved. This is someone that needs to be proven over time. So it's not a novice. Let, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so, their wives must or be grave. Uh, so must their wives be grave, not slanders, sober, faithful in all things. So a wife of a deacon can disqualify them. So you don't just look at the man, you have to consider his wife. And if she's obviously uh, slandering, if she's gossiping, then, she, then that disqualifies him. Um, they got to be faithful in all things. Let the deacons uh, be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they have used the office of a deacon, well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now verse 14 says this. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. Paul was like, I I'm telling you these things. Keep things in order because I'm getting ready to come. But then he says this in verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. How are you going to know how to behave yourself in the house of God? By looking at pastors and deacons. You're to be an example of the believers in word and deed. Not just in what you do, but who you are. And people ought to be able to look to you and know what it is to have their life together, to know what it is to have things done decently in order. And the church body ought to reflect that. That's why we select deacons, so that we have order and structure in the church. As we speak right now, the deacons are setting things up in the foyer so when you leave, you can keep on going with the message. They do that kind of stuff. They support the ministry and the mission of the church. And that's very important because as you finish up verse 15, it says... Behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. You know, when you're in electricity, in an electrical business, the ground wires can be very important. So things don't blow up. You know what? We should be grounding the culture so that the power of Christ can get delivered to it. And it's the little things. We should choose deacons, choose deacons because we can. We should choose deacons because we should. And we should choose deacons because it's good. What ends up happening after they chose the deacons is it reproduced life in verses 7 and 8 of Acts 6. You know, this is how this all ties together. You're, you're probably still going, well, Brian, what's all this got to do with choosing life and abortion and all? This is exactly what it has to do with it. God wants to reproduce life. Satan wants to abort it. God had a mission for Israel, and that mission included them obeying those commands and not giving up on life. Not, not going not one way or the other, but staying focused on the author the whole way through. Paul writes to the church, and he says, hey guys, in case I tarry long, in case the Lord doesn't come quite as soon as I thought he might have, in case things get a little dicey, I need some men to stand up in the church and be examples of what it is to hold it together. And I need their wives to stand in there with them. And I need them to be examples to the flock. Because the devil wants to abort the mission. Just as he wanted to stop the church in the first century, beloved, he wants to stop the church in the last century. And it is observing the things that he says, keeping his word, loving his word, and saying, I'm not just doing these things because it's the next box on my checklist. It's the next thing on the calendar coming up. We do these things, beloved, because when we obey the Lord and we take these things seriously, when we understand we're approaching God's word and we are the body of Christ and we are the pillar and ground of the church, all these things are important. And the thing that the devil wants to do is abort it, but you know what? He can't stop it because we've chosen life. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He isn't going to abort the mission as, as long as we stick with it. Satan wanted to abort the mission of the members. He attempted to bring division and schism to the church in Jerusalem. It didn't work. Instead, God brought peace and prosperity. 
It worked for Adam and Eve, though. Satan attacked his mind at the weaker vessel, and he caused contention and division, and things broke up there in Genesis 3. We need folks that are sober mind. Satan wanted to abort the admission of the apostles. He attempted to use fear to draw the apostles to the rear. If they were, if they were so fearful that, oh, oh, the widows are, compl- I'm going to run over and start waiting on tables. Jesus said, hey, Peter, don't do that. James, don't do that. John, don't do that. You stay in the word of God in prayer. You've got disciples that will do that. The solution didn't come from the leaders. The solution came from the leaders, if you know what I'm saying. So those guys could stay at the front and everybody could help bring up the rear. We all got to work together. Unlike Eve, the apostles were not biting on the bait. They didn't let their mind get beguiled. Satan would love to get me as your pastor and our pastor team all out of whack. But we're not going to let that happen. We're going to stay on fire for this book. We're going to pray for everything that we need to be praying for, which in itself is a tremendous responsibility. And we're going to keep doing what we're supposed to be doing and making disciples. And I'm going to trust that there are some men that will keep the parking lot clean, that will seal the cracks in the concrete, that will figure out how to take care of all this other stuff so that we can take care of the main things, which is the souls of men and women, so we don't see any more spiritual abortions. We don't see our neighbors shooting themselves in the head. We don't see people killing themselves with exhaust hoses. I'm just around our church. We had a kid kill his cousin a few years ago over here over some stupid thing. We've had people get drunk, wander off in the field and freeze to death. I mean, just craziness goes on around this county. Why? Because it needs the gospel. It needs Jesus. It goes on in all the counties. But we do hit the news quite a bit, and it's usually not good. Satan attempted to abort the mission of the church, but you know what? He failed. You know how the church always wins? We just obey. Children, it's important that we obey because there's a blessing that comes with that. So God wants to bless HBF just like he did Israel. So be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Choose life and choose deacons. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity just to gather this morning. Uh, Lord, there's a lot of choices we make. I just brought up a couple important ones this morning.